soon as well, the, the hills are starting to turn green, and so in May, my schedule uh, has me once a week climbing a mountain and staying overnight to try some new equipment that I have. Because for, for a number of years, I thought, I don't need to get new, new equipment. Why, why invest money? I'm not going to be backpacking much longer. But all of a sudden, I have plans. And it's not, I, I did 125 miles last summer, and, and, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. The other, the previous years, it, it was getting harder and harder, and, and it got, to, so I was starting to hate it. But not last summer. And I'm really looking forward to this, forward to this summer. And so I'm going to be climbing mountains down in Utah Valley. There are three mountains that I have not climbed. Uh, I'm going to go up and camp. And I've actually started going up some of the canyons already. Uh, and so keep in shape, and these little overnight trips is going to test me to not just help me get stronger, but to see whether uh, something like that's going to kill me or not. I might as well die close to Utah Valley, close to my loved ones, you know. <laughs> and I have dreamed that I was going to die in one of three different ways. Backpacking, that'd be great. If, if, you know, if you hear about me on the 10 o'clock news, hey, great, don't feel bad. <laughs> uh, second would be to uh, down in Guatemala uh, for 14 consecutive years before I had all these uh, operations uh, you know, with titanium and screws and all that stuff. I ran for 14 consecutive years an international half marathon in Guatemala. I'd like to do that one more time. And so that's the second way I dreamed that I might die. Try that one more time, and that'll be fine too. The third way is that after all of this is over with, my idea is to go back to Guatemala to finish what I started down there, and then in a shootout with a Mexican drug cartel called the Setas, after getting a bunch of them, I finally die with a smile on my face. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, uh, uh, that's the plan. But this going up, on, going on trips alone, it's not only keeping the shape and testing yourself to make sure you're gonna be able to do it, and at least have a little bit of guarantee that you can survive it. You've got to do all the things that I'm gonna put on this survival video. You've got to have a map and announce where you're going, have the route, and you'll see on my website the 14 trips that I have planned. And then there is one that I say, and if I can do these 14, there's one more that I really would like to do. That'll be my last gas trip uh, to the most remote lake in the Uintas that I've never been able to get to, and I will try that if I can get all these others done. But, so you have a map, you had your route on there, the distances. You'll see that every one of these trips are described and I have some pictures for each area. You can click on a link and you can see the topographical map that shows the, the route that I'm going to take. And if I vary from the route that I have on those maps, I'm, I have a satellite phone, or I will have. KSL Outdoors Radio provides me, they will provide me this year on 1st of June, a satellite phone for the whole summer so that I can call into the program and I can use it anytime that I have need. And I can say about a satellite phone that for a number of years, I only needed it twice. I didn't really need it, but people that I found on the trail needed it. They were both scout groups that had gone on trips and they didn't have anything like that and they had an injured boy. So I was able to loan them my satellite phone so they could call for help. All of a sudden though, I went one year, late in the season, mid-September, to uh, up over, well, up east fork of Bikes Fork, and uh, to get to Crater Lake, which is the deepest lake in the U.N., 147 feet deep. And I wanted to get up on the ridge to the north and get a picture of that beautiful lake with the Explorer Peak, you know, that, you know, that perfect picture. Well, I got snowed on, I got rained on, I got snowed on in the 20 miles to get there and I camped at the base of the mountain, and I got sick. I always have an antibiotic treatment with me. I take everything that I might need as an old guy to, to survive, even, even to do a little minor surgery, you know. I was a, medic, a medical specialist in the Army, so I know a little about that. In Guatemala, I get thousands of medical treatments every year. 
Uh, so I go prepared to do any of that, but I had antibiotic, but I had to lay there for two or three days until it started taking effect. And then I could hear them on the radio that the snow was coming again, and so I had to get out of there. I had to get up over a 12,300 foot pass and down the other side to my car. And so I started out of there, and at the last trees, I was able to, uh, oh, uh, at the base of the mountain, I wasn't able to get a signal. I wore a whole battery out from the satellite phone trying to call out. Couldn't get a signal. But I got out, going across this more open country, and I got a signal. I got a weather report from the Forest Service office in Duchesne, and they said, don't move, don't try and get over the battery, you'll die. You heard a big storm coming. So I stayed right there. They didn't wait till tomorrow. The sun should be out. Okay, it was in the morning, so I started up again. But as I got up higher and higher, for the first time, high elevation sickness, high altitude sickness started getting me. And when I was up at the 12,300 foot point, I'll tell you, I had this pain down my left arm, you know, and, and here, and just everything was going wrong. <laughs> and I got on the satellite phone, called Russ Smith, he's the one that uh, had uh, that, that read Southeast phones uh, from Sky Call, Satellites Call, and there are links to his, uh, to his uh, website on my, uh, on my uh, website. Uh, but I got him on the phone, and he, he had to make a trip, and so he would, oh, I'll just, you know, 911. And you get a Texas thing, and then they'll refer you to, uh, and I, oh, <laughs> Well, he apparently noticed that I was kind of in panic mode, so he decided to put off his trip for a while and help me. And so pretty soon it was a conference call between me, Russ Smith, the sheriff from Summit County, and the University of Utah Hospital uh, with their uh, the helicopter, whatever they call it. Yeah. And so it was this conference call uh, first thing was, well, 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 we'll trailer some horses up and we'll come in with the horse. Uh, look, <laughs> by the time they get horses, I'd be dead for sure. Well, uh, they finally decided it sounded like they were going to send a heel crosser. And, and, and they, they tried to explain to me how to get the coordinates off of my phone. And I finally was able to give them the coordinates. Uh, while this was happening, I was in a blizzard right up on the, on the pass. The wind was blowing, and I had to put my poncho on. I was on the phone, and I was going down as, as quickly as I could, uh, giving them the coordinates, and then I lost the signal. I find out way down where I could camp out for the night if I had to, in just a little clump of alpine firs. Set the phone there, no signal, but I, I set it there so I could hear it, and, and I was resting. All of a sudden, it started ringing. Got on the phone, they said, put something bright out of the ground, the helicopter's four minutes away. And so I put my bivouac bag out there, red, and held, put rocks on it to keep the wind from blowing it away. And here comes the helicopter, flying over. You know, you've seen this scene in the movies all the time, you know, you know, and people are yelling like this, so the helicopter's gonna be able to hear you. <laughs> I wasn't doing that, I was smart enough to know that there was no use, no use in yelling. But I was trying to move, you know. He just went over and went over the next mountain, disappeared. Uh, but I was on the phone with the dispatcher at the University of Utah Hospital. He was in radio contact with the helicopter pilot. We got him turned around and came back over the second time. And he still didn't see me. And I said, tell him to get lower. So finally, he got lower and he came and he saw me. Just down. By then, I'd rested a half an hour and I was 1,300 feet lower. The high altitude wasn't bothering me anymore, and I felt great. <laughs> and I said, hey, well, I appreciate it. Just, just take me down to the trailhead to where I got my car parked, and uh, I'll go to the doctor on Monday and see if anything's wrong with me, you know? No, 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 no. They, they laid me out, and they got things, things on me, and I had high blood pressure, my pulse was 132 or something, and, and uh, oxygen in my blood was half of what it should have been. So they insisted on taking me out of there. And I said, well, at least take me to the, to the Odell Edwards Stadium. The, the game is going to start in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I just feel pretty good, you know, joking. Well, I was up on that mountain. It wasn't funny at all. But coming down 1,300 feet, of course, this experience has, has taught me 
You know, I shouldn't have tried to go over that mountain. Heck with my car. I just go down Lake Fork to Moon Lake, call my kids on the side of my phone, have them come and get me, swing around and get my car, and I could have saved a lot of money because when they send a <laughs> helicopter in there for you, it's not cheap. The bill is actually $10,000. With Medicare, it only cost me a thousand, but even a thousand, you know. Well, from some county had to do with that. <laughs> At least he was on the line, you know. And so, uh, a satellite phone is something I really promote. Every group should have one. A group of scouts, any group that are going, they have one. But then there's the other, another thing that I didn't have in these first years, and that's what, what's called a spot tractor. I was supposed to have brought mine in on top of my little. <coughs> Trailer. I'm living on, if you saw a little trailer, a little funky looking little trailer across the street, that's mine. That's where I live. Uh, but uh, my spot tracker got there. Should have brought it in the shot to. It's an incredible little device. You know, you just program it, you program, program, program into it. Ten email, you know, people with early emails. And when you're on a trip, you just turn it on, hit the OK button, and it sends a signal to the satellite that's up there somewhere. And it triggers an email message which you compose saying, oh, I'm fine, I'm on the west work of wherever, you know. Uh, and so they get that okay message and they know you're alive. If they don't get a message tomorrow, at least they know where I was yesterday. They had a starting point. You remember the fellow, Eric Robinson, who, uh, in Australia, who got lost in the U.N.S. Uh, uh, it's been three years now. His body has still never been found. He had a tracking device with him, but he didn't use it. Well, I use mine all the time. So you have a spot tracker. Of course, if you're in trouble, you hit the 911 button. And within 15 minutes, search and rescue are coming for you. Uh, and so a spot tracker, satellite phone, of course, your loved one should have a map of where you're going. And with me, I put on a website, the whole world can know where I I'm supposed to be, and the, the, the trail I'm going to follow, and so this is really critical for them to know this. Uh, and then, of course, with the satellite phone, you can phone home every evening, or you can leave it on at, at 9 o'clock at night for five minutes if you don't want to spend any money, you know, uh, making a call in case there's an emergency at home and they have to contact you. They can call you. So a satellite phone, I think, is, is really, really important. A spot tracker. Have the maps, let people know where you're going, and more or less when you're going to be at each each location. Um, and so, anyway, then, uh, that's pretty well my presentation. There's a lot of stuff that could be said. I was going uh, just to have you feeling really good about the high women. You've heard the 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 the, uh, the information that uh, the, the U.N. Mountains is the only mountain range. Uh, in the lower 48 states that goes from east to west. Okay, that makes us a little unique. Uh, along with the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, Uinta Mountains has the most contiguous above timberline area of any mountains in the United States. So it's the San Juans and the Uintas. But there's another statement I found in, in uh, the uh, Intermountain Flora magazine. It says, according to it says the Uintas, uh, er, Uintas area above timberline in a true alpine flora surpasses all of the alpine areas in, in the Intermountain West combined. So, uh, it, the Uintas are a special place. They're not maybe as rough and tough as like the Wind Rivers, but for an old guy like me, they're just great. <laughs> and there's plenty of places where you can uh, uh, get to remote areas where you'll never see another human being and where maybe another human being has not been for a long time. And I see a hand back there and I will get to you. Okay, what's the question? Carter, Carter Road from Vernal to Fort Bridger, from Fort Duchesne to Fort Bridger. Have you ever encountered any information about the Carter Road? Oh yes. Have you? I, I, have I would love, maybe not everybody's interested, but I would love to have your thoughts on where I go and find more information. I'm kind of a Now, I got from the Forest Service up in uh, Mountain View, Wyoming, a publication on the Carter Road. The old and military Carter Road. Fun, and last year, 
there is a scenic drive that takes off uh, between between uh, Mountain View and Manila. Uh, there's a crossroads. Oh, and by the way, you know the first uh, in 1825, the first mountain man rendezvous was on the Henry's Fork that also comes out of Summit County, uh, and it was on the Henry's Fork River. It's actually in Wyoming, uh, but uh, Jedediah Smith and all the good guys were there. But at that crossroads, where there's a little store run by, uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, she's been there for 47 years. She's from Idaho, married to Coco. We've been there all these years. Uh, but there's a little store, and it's the only store between Mountain View and Manila. And there's only one chapel of any church of any kind also. It's in uh, McKinnon, I believe, which is just a little way down the road. But at that little store, there's a road that takes off, and there's a scenic drive. It starts as a paved road and then it turns into a dirt road, but a well, uh, well graded uh, road, and it swings up around the Uintas, and you can see the last peaks of the Uintas, and then you come out and connect it with the road that uh, that comes from Manila and goes along uh, and uh, over to Vernal, you know. But you, but on that scenic drive, part of it follows the old Carter Military Road, and that was that was a pathway used by the Indians. There were two routes that Indians used uh, to go through the Uintas uh, back in ancient times. And one of them was that, and the other one was up Henry's Fork, where most people go to uh, climb King's Peak, uh, go over Gunsight Pass, and then down the Uinta River. So that was another pathway, but the, the, the Carter Road was important. And, and uh, that, by the way, uh, if there was lots of time, I was going to tell you about uh, the Butch Cassidy, and uh, that, that's part of what we could call the Outlaw Trail. He went up, to, he used the, the Carter, Old Carter Road to get across the Uintas, stayed the night at Piedmont, on his way to rob the uh, bank up in uh, Mount Pillar, Idaho, which he was doing to get money to pay a lawyer to get his friend, um, Matt Warner, out of jail. He had been... Uh, employed by Caleb Rhodes, the Rhodes Mine, the Lost Rhodes Mine. There's a whole story, there's another of the mysteries and the incredible stories about the Uintas. Uh, but uh, Caleb, uh, with his partner, were, were trying to get permission to get back on the Indian Reservation where there were seven old Spanish mines. He knew the location of some of them. Well, uh, but, a couple, but Matt Warner, they were attacked by one of the opposing forces, killed two of them, got put in jail, and then there was a, a mob formed to lynch them over in Vernal, so they were transferred over to Ogden, and so Butch Cassidy was hired by Caleb Rhodes to get uh, his buddy War, uh, Matt Warner out of jail, but they decided they could get him out if they get a, got a good lawyer, but they needed money, so they headed over to Carter Road, Stayed the night at Piedmont, on to Montpelier, Idaho, robbed the bank to get the money to, for the lawyer, and as it wor works out, uh, they didn't get their buddy Matt Warner off. He spent four years in the penitentiary. But uh, so yeah, the, the Carter Road is that's another <coughs> under and, and, and gold in the UN. I have found it, a whole mountain of it. I, I'm not kidding. At sunset, King's Peak turns into gold. <laughs> and I have a picture of, of Queen's Peak being turned into gold at sunset. <laughs> that's the only gold I've found. <laughs> of course, I, uh, the Lost Road Mine, that is another of the aspects of the UNS that I'm going to weave into the story of, of Jedediah Smith, who was the first actually white man to trap beaver on the north slope of the UNS. Uh, and then, of course, there was the Thai hackers later on, and then there's the, but the Spanish were the first. Uh, some people believe, believe that Escalante and Dominguez were the first white people to see the Uintas. But they weren't. They, were Sp they, they had come up from Santa Fe through the Uinta Basin following the old Spanish trail. Well, the Spaniards had come up there years before looking for gold that apparently, uh, supposedly, Montezuma had sent north from, uh, uh, from the Aztec Empire to, uh, to hide it from the, so the Spaniards wouldn't get it. And it's uh, supposedly hidden the Uintas. And uh, so the Spaniards came into in the Uinta Basin as early as 1540. 
And so that's, there's that whole story, and then coming out of that, of course, is the Lost Rose Mine, and uh, that, that's a whole different <laughs> subject, you know. But it's all fascinating. But there's, there's more to the Uinus than just much mountains. And that's what I want to, I want to weave all these things into the story. And by the way, Bigfoot is another aspect of it. Uh, on the Weaver River, it was the first sighting of Bigfoot. <laughs> But the most sightings have been on Little East Fork of Black's Fork. And I've been up there three times to give Bigfoot a chance to find me so I could take his family portrait. But he hasn't found me yet. I'm going to give him one more chance. <laughs> In fact, I even have a picture of him on, on from one of my posts from last, or my YouTube videos from last year. You look on there, you, if you look at one, uh, it's the East, Little East Fork of Black's Fork, going over Squaw Pass. And in that YouTube video, I talk about two Bigfoot experiences I had in a dream. <laughs> I, 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 sh I maybe should have added that, <laughs> but I, I don't want you to think I'm totally nuts, you know. So I, <laughs> but I did dream him, and so I, you could see him in one of the pictures. There. So, so that's another part of the the Uinta story. Uh, the place where he's been sighted most in, in Utah. So, uh, okay, and let me just say, uh, like I say, uh, I've changed uh, Winston Churchill's statement, never give in easily. <laughs> and so I, I try like crazy, you know. And then it says, death be not boring. I've lived well, I've adventured widely, I will not die poorly. So, one of these three ways, I, you know, I, I'd rather, i prefer one of those three ways than, than to die, you know, like, as a cat for tail. <laughs> you know what I mean? So anyway. There you go. That's a picture. Oh, I mean, I know you told us, but where's it at? Red, ca Red Castle Mountain. This is up Smith's Fork, and that, and that was named for Jedediah Smith. I kind of started with Jedediah Smith years ago as a kid. And I, and I have named a mountain, the fifth highest mountain in Utah, Mount Jedediah, in honor of, uh, of him. It's the third mountain down from King's Peak. It was an unnamed mountain, and I call it Mount Jedediah. It's Smith Fork, of course, has already got his name. Uh, he was an incredible guy. He died young. He didn't have a boring life. He adventured widely, <laughs> and he died at like 28, you know. But he had a number of firsts. He was the first white man to go all the way down through the Mojave Desert into California, and then to come back through the, uh, the Sierra Nevada Mountains, uh, and all kinds of stuff. So but anyway, that's up Smith's Fork. Uh, that's, uh, you know, you've got the Bear River, and then you've got uh, the, um, uh, the Black's Fork, and then uh, Smith's Fork, and next over is the Henry's Fork, and, for the, and it's all some county. So you got a great county. How far is the walk to for that location? Okay, it's about 14 miles, uh, 12 to 14 miles, I believe, uh, to the base of uh, uh, Red Castle Peak. And that is a well used trail. Uh, you don't have to wade through rivers. There's bridges, two bridges across uh, the stream. So uh, a lot of people go in there. But once again, uh, you can get to the upper lakes, and there's an East Red Castle Lake, where I have caught the biggest native cutthroat that I've caught anywhere, up to eight pounds. Wow. Uh, you'll see some of those on, on if you will, go to my website, and just, because one of my last trips is going to be back up into that area. There's some of these trips that uh, I, I'm going to try and get the lakes that I've just not got to, but some of the trips are just to special areas like Red Castle that I want to go back to one more time. So, Thank you. okay. What's the name of the lake on your 15th trip that you're planning? <laughs> um, East Slide Lake. East Slide Lake. Moon Lake. And as Lake Fort comes into uh, uh, Moon Lake, there's a creek that comes into East, uh, to, uh, to Lake Fork uh, up above Moon Lake. Uh, that's a weak creek. And it's just a little bit up a week creek, and then it's up on a side canyon. 
and to uh, they say, oh, you, you got to go down and trust Lake Fork, and then oh, we, but there's a, it's, uh, the, the streams are in ravines. You have to have ropes, and you have to rope down, and, and, be, and so my way is to go clear up around, and then come down from the top, wow. and traverse down the side of the canyon, and try and get to it. <laughs> Wow. And it probably, you know, it, it'll be like, probably like a swamp and the fish probably are just little tiny ones, <laughs> you know, but uh, it, just kind of a challenge, you know, it, uh, it's just a place that um, mm. has always just mystified me, you know, just, you know, I just like to get there, <laughs> yeah. even if there's nothing in it. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay. What's the weirdest thing you've ever encountered under rain? The lake? The weirdest, uh, you know, the, the things that are most memorable, of course, are my own personal survival experiences where maybe I should have died. <laughs> you know, I've, I've had experiences with, with uh, I've seen bull elk a, a few times, really close, just beautiful. Uh, uh, probably the, the rarest uh, was a pine, I saw a pine marten that came into our camp once, and I didn't have my camera, it was over there, you know, and I couldn't move. And he was just all over. And this, you don't see them very often. Pine, what can it be compared to? Well, yeah, it's bigger than a mink, though, usually. It's, it's more like the size of an otter, maybe, a river otter. It, it's, it's in that same family, I guess. Uh, it, you know, I'll probably think later about how to answer your question right. Uh, um, like no strange lights or anything. <laughs> well, I, I, oh, okay, I, I just thought of that. On my, uh, I haven't mentioned Crow Basin here today, have I? I, I don't think I have. On, on the south slope of the Uintas, uh, the smallest drainage in the whole Uintas is called the, it's called the Dry Gulch Drainage. And uh, it's between Yellowstone River and Yona River. A part of it is Crow Basin. And Crow Basin is sort of like a box canyon. You have to go up a ridge, and you go through a beautiful area uh, from, from uh, aerial photographs. I have aerial photographs of it. It's called Jackson Park. It looks like a golf course or something. It's a beautiful uh, meadow area. And then you have to go down into Crow Basin. And I, my first uh, tr time trying that a couple of years ago, I didn't make it. I, I was just, I, it was too hard for me to move. I wasn't agile. I wasn't, didn't have good balance. I didn't trust myself to be able to go down into a rough area like that and be able to get back out. Uh, but this last year I made it. And I finally, I looked for a way down in and I, I finally found a way and, uh, and this was on, uh, in, this was for Pioneer Day. And I was thinking of my great, my great grandmother, Alice Brooks. And, and so I was thinking, wow, well, they were tough. And they, I've got to be tough too, you know. And, and so I found this trail and I called it the Yeehaw Trail. And so down I went, uh, and so that, that, that was great, uh, and there I met some people from here, and I was hoping that they would be here, but I don't, um, like Michael, uh, Darren, Darren and Ryan, like Michael, yeah. and Ryan, and Ryan, yeah, the son, uh, and then there was Summer Hayes, uh, now he's probably not from here. But he's a friend, of course, of uh, Michael. It was Tom and whatever Summer Hayes, his, his son. I was at, I made it to Crow Basin, uh, Crow Lake. To, excuse me, I was camped out there. And then all of a sudden, these guys appeared. They knew from my website, uh, having announced where I was going, they threw together, together a trip real quick to meet me there. Oh. <laughs> uh, and, and that was a credible experience. Uh, they had uh, read my reports from previous years and gone there and reported on it. And, and I quote some of the things that they say about uh, Crow Basin, but they met me there. And, and so uh, that was the Yeehaw Trail note. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, on the previous attempt to get there, I was going up along Jackson Park, then I went down, I thought maybe on the north end I'd be able to get down in there, but I came to an escarpment there that young people could, could go down. But I, uh, boulder hopping, that kind of stuff, 
when it's really steep, it's just not for me, not, not, at least, not for the way I was two years ago at least, or three years ago I guess it was. And so, I, but I left my pack and I hiked up to be able to get pictures, better pictures of the area, and then a few drops of rain started falling, so I got back to my pack real quick, I started down and then I had to go up an area to get to Jackson Park and it started pouring down rain. Well, I got under some trees, you know, but I can say, no, I gotta get my poncho on. And so I got out from under the tree and I threw my poncho to get it over my pad and I lost my balance. And I went backwards over a log and actually got hung by my feet, uh, my pack, you know, I was just hanging there in the air <laughs> on, this, on this log. My, my one foot was tangled in the, in the roots and, and I got, my ankles got to be broken. The, the, the pressure of having fallen with my pack and weight and everything, it, it just had to break something. But I finally got my pack off, dropped it off, and then I was able to reach out and grab a root and pull myself up and somehow my ankle was all right. And so then I got my poncho on and I went up and the rain just kept coming and as I got right to the edge of Jackson Park, the lightning hit. And it was lightning, that was the lightning and the thunder was the same instant. It was right there, right on top of me. And, and I have tried to recreate what I experienced. And this is on my report from Crow Basin from last summer. I show what I actually saw. As this one lightning hit, it just, it just shook the ground and, it, and there were little wisps, wavy wisps of electricity just dancing all around me. That really is the most incredible experience I've ever had in the outdoors. Scary. I didn't feel anything. I, you know, I just <laughs> all these electricity dancing all around me. But that probably is, would call. And I've, I've tried to depict it by use of Photoshop. Yeah. <laughs> and I do say, uh, you know, I say Photoshop. So I'm not trying to deceive everybody. If, if the rain was coming down so hard, I, you know, I, I didn't want to camera on it. I, I couldn't take a picture of it. It would have been incredible to, to have been able to do it. But So that's probably the, the greatest, uh, most memorable experience that I've ever had and survived. Yeah. Because it, I, I think probably, I, it must have been really close to maybe <laughs> being really dangerous. I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other 